This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Saturday will be the 100th birthday of Henry Kissinger. He served as national security advisor and secretary of state in the Nixon and Ford administrations. Today, we look at Kissinger's ongoing influence on the national security state as the United States engages in declared and undeclared wars around the world. Human rights advocates consider Kissinger a war criminal who has escaped accountability. We begin with a damning new investigation by The Intercept on the secret U.S. bombing of Cambodia that killed as many as 150,000 civilians that Kissinger authorized during the U.S. war in Vietnam. Reporter Nick Turris has revealed unreported mass killings after examining formerly classified U.S. military documents and traveling to 12 remote Cambodian villages to interview more than 75 witnesses and survivors of the U.S. attacks. With this new piece, Nick Terse also publishes transcripts of Kissinger's phone calls that show his key role in Cambodia, and CIA records connecting Kissinger's actions to the growth of Cambodia's Khmer Rouge, the regime that massacred two million people from 1975 to 1979. Nick Terse is a contributing writer for The Intercept. His books include Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam. His new story is headlined Blood on His Hands, Survivors of Kissinger's Secret War in Cambodia Reveal Unreported Mass Killings. Nick Terse, welcome back to Democracy Now! Why don't you lay out the scope of your investigation and its most stunning conclusions, what you were most shocked by in this extensive report. Thank you so much for having me on. You know, I think the, the key takeaway of uh, this package of articles is that Henry Kissinger is responsible for more civilian deaths in Cambodia than was previously known, uh, according to uh, this exclusive archive of U.S. military documents that I assembled and also interviews with uh, Cambodian witnesses and survivors, as well as uh, Americans who, who witnessed or took part in uh, these attacks. Uh, the archive offers uh, previously unpublished, uh, unreported, and also underappreciated evidence of hundreds of civilian casualties that were kept secret uh, during the U.S. war in Cambodia, uh, most of them from 1969 to 1973, the years that Henry Kissinger provided, uh, presided over it. And, uh, and these remain almost entirely unknown to the American people today. Uh, a, a key to this reporting was uh, previously unpublished interviews with more than 75 Cambodian witnesses and survivors of U.S. military attacks, and speaking with them uh, revealed new details about the long-term trauma uh, borne by survivors of the American war there. So taken together, uh, this adds to the list of killings and crimes that, uh, that Henry Kissinger should, uh, even at this very late date, uh, in his life uh, be asked to answer for. And uh, Nick, could you talk a little bit about the the uh, the, the military documents you found? Uh, I, I, in your articles, I was uh, uh, I was quite surprised to dis discover, although I guess it's been re reported previously, that Kissinger himself was uh, taping or transcribing conversations that he had with the president and and other officials uh, about the war in uh, uh, in Cambodia. Yes, that's right. Uh, I wrote a, a short sidebar about this. Uh, people know about uh, Nixon's uh, White House taping. Uh, what really laid him low uh, is in the Watergate scandal. But, uh, but most people don't realize that Kissinger was also uh, taping uh, all his phone conversations. And you know, he had a, a group of aides that transcribed these. And you know, through these transcripts, uh, you can see uh, you know Kissinger's. Uh, you know how how hands on he was with his policies in in Cambodia, and how you can see him relaying orders from from Nixon. Uh, you know some uh, some White House uh, officials that I spoke with, uh, who were privy to these conversations at the time, uh, were often worried that uh, that President Nixon was was drunk. Uh, during some of these conversations, he was slurring his words and uh, and giving orders to, uh, in in one case that I focus on, uh, you know, attack, uh, you know, anything or it was uh, to to send anything that flies on anything that moves in Cambodia. 
basically attack everything with uh, planes and helicopter gunships. And you can see the order come right from Nixon. Nixon pass it down to his uh, military aide, Alexander Haig. And then uh, I was able to show that, uh, that you could see the palpable effects in the field that uh, just after these orders came down, uh, helicopter attacks uh, on uh, Cambodia went uh, sky high. They tripled over the course of, of the month after this call. So you can really see the direct effects of, uh, of Kissinger uh, in the White House and how it affected Cambodians on the ground. I want to start with your article, <clears throat> the, how you start your article in Cambodia. At the end of a dusty path snaking through rice paddies lives a woman who survived multiple U.S. airstrikes as a child, round-faced and just over five feet tall in plastic sandals. Mias Lorne lost an older brother to a helicopter gunship attack and an uncle and cousins to artillery fire. For decades, one question haunted her. I still wonder why those aircraft always attacked in this area. Why did they drop bombs here? Can you elaborate on this? And I want to say, for our radio listeners, for television, we're showing photographs that you have, an incredible um, gold mine of uh, photographs that you took when you uh, made these visits. Talk about these details, the specific stories. Yes. Uh, you know, Mies Lorne's uh, story and, and the, the suffering that uh, that she endured, the trauma that she's lived with all these years, uh, it like like so many of the stories that I heard in Cambodia really really stuck with me, and um, you know and 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 her question was one that I heard again and again. Uh, Cambodian uh, villagers in these these remote uh, villages on the border with Vietnam, uh, they had no idea why they were attacked. Uh, one day, American aircraft uh, just started appearing overhead. Uh, they had no reference, uh, frame of reference for why this was happening. Uh, they didn't understand it, uh, but uh, they, they soon came to fear uh, these machines. And for years on end, uh, they were terrorized by them. Uh, I actually took her question uh, to Henry Kissinger when I tried to, to confront him with questions for this article. And I asked him to, to answer uh, the, the question that she had asked me, why did they attack here? And, uh, and Kissinger uh, responded with sarcasm, uh, anger, and, uh, and stomped off. Uh, you know, he, he was able to beat an easy retreat and, uh, and, and save himself from this questioning. But, uh, but Cambodians like, uh, like Mies Lorne were, you know, didn't have any sort of uh, easy means of escape. You know, there was uh, another village that I, I visited, and um, uh, I, I have some photographs from that as well. Uh, these were taken by by my wife, uh, Tam Terse, who reported this along with me. And uh, there was a village that was mentioned in U.S. documents. Uh, they mentioned an attack on May 1st, 1970. A helicopter circled a Cambodian village. Uh, the Americans had a phonetic spelling of it called Moroan. But there was no village in Cambodia called Moroan. It's, it's not a Cambodian name. But there was one called Moron on the border. And we set about trying to find it. We got close and we spent uh, two days driving around local roads asking for directions. Uh, we finally turned off the highway onto a red dirt track that cut, cut through some lush farmland. It then ended with a footpath and it took us into this village. Uh, I quickly found the village chief and I, I read him uh, the excerpt from the documents that uh, during this attack, 12 villagers were killed, five were wounded. This is from U.S. records. And after the assault, uh, survivors fled their village, said, and they uh, went to another one called Kantut. So uh, when I asked him about this particular attack, it was like many Cambodian villages that I visited. Uh, the, he, was, he was baffled by it. They'd endured so many airstrikes over the years. Uh, he, he couldn't remember one single strike, but when he thought about the date, he told me that's right. He gestured toward an area at the edge of the village and said uh, they attacked uh, intensely at that time, and then everyone here fled for Kantut. So I knew that we had the right place. And uh, this village chief, a man named Shen Hang, uh, lost his mother, his father, his grandfather, a nephew, a niece. And, uh, and other more distant relatives to airstrikes. Uh, he and several other survivors told me about relentless attacks. 
And as he talked to me, his eyes reddened and then they, they went vacant. And, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he sunk to his knees and, and moved to a far corner of the room. And, you know, it, it, uh, you know, I, 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 I let him be, uh, he eventually returned to the conversation, but, uh, this was the type of trauma that I encountered again and again. It, it had been decades, uh, but the, this this trauma wrought by Henry Kissinger's policies was still so amazingly fresh and, and palpable in all of these villages. And Nick, uh, the the U.S. bombing campaign and the war in Cambodia was uh, followed, obviously, by the the uh, the rise of the Khmer Rouge and also the genocide that the rest of the world associates more with Cambodia than in, in anything else. I'm wondering, uh, you're reporting w what connection, if any, uh, between uh, the uh, uh, this bombing, this massive bombing campaign for which U.S. officials have never been held responsible, and the rise of the Khmer Rouge. Sure. I mean, uh, of course, the Khmer Rouge is, is culpable for the genocide in Cambodia and the, the two million deaths. Uh, but uh, as you as you mentioned, it's been long overlooked uh, just how destabilizing the U.S. bombing was. There was such displacement of uh, of Cambodians uh, within their own country, uh, such trauma caused by uh, uh, the, the U.S. attacks, these relentless attacks, and uh, tremendous quantities of, of bombs dropped, uh, that the Khmer Rouge used all this uh, as a recruiting tool. Uh, they went around to villages and said that the only way to make this stop was to join their movement, which before the U.S. bombing was a really a small fringe movement of just thousands of people. Uh, by the end of the U.S. bombing, the Khmer Rouge numbered 200,000 people. Uh, and I mean, this, this, the U.S. attacks were the centerpiece of, of their uh, recruiting drive. And it, uh, you know, un unfortunately, it worked uh, all too well. And uh, so, you know, uh, President Nixon and, uh, and Henry Kissinger uh, certainly uh, played a, a key role in enabling this genocide to happen. In 2016, during an event at the LBJ Library, Henry Kissinger was asked to respond to those who call him a war criminal. I, I think the word war criminal should not be thrown around in the domestic debate. It's a shameful it's a reflection on the people who use it. As Henry Kissinger turns 100 years old on Saturday, in addition to Nick Terse, who's written this astounding series in The Intercept, um, headline Blood on His Hands, we're joined by the Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Greg Grandin, author of the book Kissinger's Shadow, The Long Reach of America's Most Controversial Statesman. Greg's latest article is headlined, Henry Kissinger, a war criminal still at large at 100. Can you take off from where Nick Terse um, left off, Greg Grandin, and tell us how, uh, though so many have come under a microscope, like Nixon and his whole group in the White House, uh, Kissinger somehow escaped this by the establishment media, though um, independent media has long been fiercely critical of him. Tell us Kissinger's full story, Greg. Well, it would take a lot more time than we have to tell Kissinger's full story is turning on when years old. Uh, I think that what, what's what's interesting is that, I, I mean, Kissinger is a war criminal, but there are lots of war criminals. I mean, the, the people who conduct, conducted the, as the, as Jeff Sachs talked about, the Iraq war, are, you know, can be held culpable for the destruction of a, of a country in an illegal war. What's, what's, what's interesting is that in some ways the, the crimes are ongoing. I mean, you know, there's many, many unexploded ordinances in, in Laos, in Cambodia, that are still killing people. So the, the crimes are, uh, well, not of the past, but they're the present. That said, I think that the best way to think about Kissinger isn't necessarily as a war criminal. I think that in some ways that shuts down debate. Kissinger as a personality uh, is so oversized, he eclipses his context. I think Kissinger is, is, Kissinger's life actually has a lot to teach us about how we got 
to the point where we are, that in way that, 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 again, Jeff Sachs talked about this, that this, this multi-fronted, never-ending, endless war and military-industrial complex. Now, Cambodia, the bombing of Cambodia was done in secret for five years. It was a covert operation. Um, people know that, but I, I don't think it was mentioned. And, and the reason it had to be covert was because it was illegal. It was illegal to bomb. We weren't, a, we weren't at war with, with Cambodia. It wasn't a, it wasn't a, um, it wasn't a country that the United States had 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 had, had was had declared war on or was at war with. Um, and and the the reasons why the the excuses that Kissinger has given for a five year long bombing campaign that that caused enormous damage, including bringing to power the most eliminationist extremist uh, cadre within the Khmer Rouge and leading to the genocide was that it had it was to eliminate safe havens. It, it, it was an act of self defense. This is now taken as a common practice. This is basically fundamentally what the entire U.S. war on terror is authorized to do, to go into any country and drone and bomb and conduct military operations, some we know about, some we don't know about, but as a matter of course. So we don't do it in secret. So Kissinger's trajectory from Cambodia, from being the the architect of this secret campaign to bomb a country the United States wasn't at war with, to the state we are in now, governed by a national security state, is, is, is what I think is most instructive about Kissinger's life and most important about him, other than describing him as a war criminal, which, which he is. And Greg, why do you think that he remains such a significant figure? Uh, uh, as you mentioned, he escaped all of the the scandal of the Nixon years and went on to be a a highly influential figure, not only in uh, the actual political world, but obviously uh, in in the media as well. And he was always uh, referred, or almost by the corporate press, as a revered figure in in American foreign policy and national security. Yeah, the press loved him, and he was very good at playing the press. Especially, uh, he was very good at at, uh, at weathering Watergate. His fingers were all over. He he basically pushed Nixon to set up the plumbers because he was obsessed that Daniel Ellsberg, who released the Pentagon Papers, had information about Cambodia. Cambodia Cambodia threads through all of this, um, and and Kissinger was instrumental in in in. Pushing Nixon to set up the the covert operation that that went into Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office and went into and went into the Watergate hotel because he was he wanted he wanted to, he wanted to basically take down Ellsberg and and Kissinger survived that basically because he wasn't he wasn't a he didn't seem like the thugs that Nixon had around him or, you know Haldeman and Ehrlichman with the the Prussians they were called and 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 the and the, and the press really kind of fell for the gravitas that he projected and they were looking for somebody that they could trust that they can they can hang something on and 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 still have faith in 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 the national uh, in, in 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 the institution of the presidency executive branch and Kissinger was very attuned to this he played people like Ted Koppel very well um, and then and then what's interesting about Kissinger though more than anything we know about his eight years in office he was national security director and secretary of state. Uh, under Nixon and Ford for a full eight years, uh, Secretary of State for the last couple of those years, um, and and we know we, we have we have documents we have we have you know Kissinger has, himself has released has has declassified has given his archive to Yale, but it's what what happened after uh, he, when he becomes a kind of sage pundit. A bipartisan pundit, the, Bill Clinton rehabilitates Kissinger as a way of giving him a certain seriousness in foreign policy that, as a governor of Arkansas, he didn't have. So he, he rehabilitates him for the Democratic Party. Um, and then Kissinger founds, of course, Kissinger Associates. And so he's out of office now for what? For 76 to now is, you know, a half a day, 50 years. And, 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 and during that time, he his Kissinger Associates has been a kind of premier 
concierge service for the global elite. It's, uh, it's broken, it basically broken the privatization of national industries in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, in Russia. Uh, he's, he's a key player in all of these movements. We have no information about any of that, right? That, and it's arguably more consequential in some ways. I mean, maybe not, maybe. I, I guess, I guess the, the, the actual war crimes were, were when he was in office for eight years. But there is this, there is this black hole of his role as 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 a, as a as a consultant to the to the to the to the global elite during this con very consequential moment in which an enormous amount of wealth tr transferred from from the bottom to the top and and Kissinger was deeply involved in that he helped broke in Africa for example uh, he told he told Clinton that that Clinton had political capital to do only one of two things this first year. He could either pass Hillary Clinton's national health program, or he could push for NAFTA. And he advised him to push for NAFTA, and Clinton did. And we got NAFTA, and we didn't get a health care expansion, which I, I think says a lot about about the, 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 the post-Cold War trajectory of the United States and how we got I to I wanted where to we go quickly now. to the 2016 Democratic presidential debate in Milwaukee when Senator Bernie Sanders criticized his opponent Hillary Clinton's relationship with her fellow former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and cited Kissinger's role in Cambodia. In her book and in this last debate, she talked about getting the approval or the support or the mentoring of Henry Kissinger. Now, I find it rather amazing, because I happen to believe that Henry Kissinger was one of the most destructive secretaries of state in the modern history of this country. I am proud to say that Henry Kissinger is not my friend. I will not take advice from Henry Kissinger. And in fact, Kissinger's actions in Cambodia when the United States bombed that country over through Prince Sihanouk, created the instability for Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge to come in, who then butchered some three million innocent people, one of the worst genocides in the history of the world. So count me in as somebody who will not be listening to Henry Kissinger. So that was presidential candidate Bernie Sanders versus presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. And then you have the late celebrity chef, Anthony Bourdain, who once said, once you've been to Cambodia, you'll never stop wanting to beat Henry Kissinger to death with your bare hands. You'll never again be able to open a newspaper and read about that treacherous, prevaricating, murderous scumbag sitting down for a nice chat with Charlie Rose or attending some black tie affair for a new glossy magazine without choking. Witness what Henry did in Cambodia, the fruits of his genius for statesmanship, and you'll never under understand why he's not sitting in the dock at The Hague next to Milosevic. Now, those were the words of Anthony Bourdain. And I want to get your comment on this, Greg, and then Nick Terse. Yeah, well, again, Cambodia, the centrality of Cambodia in this transition, transitional period of the U.S. national security state, and its importance, you know, the, 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 the human damage and costs and pain and suffering is is overwhelming to think about but more more kind of stepping back and thinking about its role in 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 the the kind of trajectory of US power um, one thing we didn't talk about is Kissinger's role in in the October surprise of 1968 the New York Times just r ran uh, an article more or less confirming Reagan's role in <laughs> in, in in the October surprise uh, regarding the uh, Iranian hostages but but Kissinger you know Kissinger in the 19 50s and 60s was a Rockefeller Republican. He was he understood himself as a liberal Republican, and he was shocked when Nixon got the got the got the nomination in 1968. He thought his political career was over. But then he re re reached out to the Nixon campaign, and he said, "You know, I got, I got contacts in 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 the Johnson campaign. I can let you know what's going on." In the, with the with the peace talks in Paris that were that were hoping to wind down the war and might have brought you been given Humphrey the presidency, and Kissinger passed on information that the Nixon campaign then used to scuttle those talks, 
And 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 then once he was appointed, he was awarded, he was awarded with that by being appointed national security advisor. And then once he came into the office, he had to figure out a way to restart the the peace talks because because Nixon promised to end the war. So what can you do? You just scuttle the peace talks. How do you restart them? Well, one of the one of the not the stated justifications, but one of the just one of the reasons why he started bombing Cambodia and became obsessed about Cambodia was he was trying to kind of project a certain kind of madman theory to the North Vietnamese that that the Nixon administration was so crazy they would start bombing Cambodia and maybe this would bring them back to the negotiating tables. And of course, it didn't, and the war dragged out and, and for another another five years for no reason. It could have ended in 1968. It could have ended, you know, and, 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 and millions of lives were lost, Vietnamese, tens of thousands of lives were lost in the United States, all as a result of, of, this, of, this, of this moment, this first October surprise in 1968. And again, Cambodia playing a central role in, in that history. Nick Terse, we just have a minute, and we want to give you the last word after this massive investigation you've done and documents you've uncovered and people's voices that haven't been heard before. Yes. Uh, and I wanted to bring it back to the Anthony Bourdain quote and, and just offer up one case that I chronicle. And this is from the U.S. records. Americans shot up a village uh, with helicopters using machine gun fire rockets. And then uh, South Vietnamese forces, an American officer landed. They began looting this village. Uh, an American officer stole a Suzuki motorbike and hauled it onto his helicopter. Other Americans noticed that there was a young Cambodian girl, maybe five years old, who was shot and bleeding, lying on the ground. They wanted to, uh, to take her for medical care. But the officer who dragged the motorbike on board said negative. They were weighed down by the bike and they had no room. And they left this girl uh, there to die. Uh, this happened after Henry Kissinger gave that order uh, to, uh, anything that flies and anything that moves. So this is Henry Kissinger's legacy. And this is what Anthony Bourdain was talking about. Intercept reporter Nick Terse will link to your four-part series, including the piece Blood on His Hands, Survivors of Kissinger's Secret War in Cambodia Reveal Unreported Mass Killings. And we want to thank Yale University professor Greg Grandin, author of the book Kissinger's Shadow. We'll link to your new article, Henry Kissinger, A War Criminal Still at Large at 100. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez.